io non vedo il Ci lato sei. destro. Sì, va bene. Ok, sì. eccoci. All right, we're going to go. All right, little tech problems. We're done. Here we are. Ok. Um, you know, welcome everybody. It's good to see everybody. I'm glad y'all are out of the, um, everybody's thawed, it sounds like. So that's good. Thank you for being here. Um, Lorenzo's here helping. I lost track of him. He's on there somewhere. Hello, Lorenzo. Lorenzo's got everybody's microphones muted. So I'm going to ask that y'all keep your microphones muted. And then um, when we get towards the end, I'll open it up to questions. Y'all can always type into the chat, though. And you can ask a question and Lorenzo will relay it to me. And I think he's going to type in to some of the more kind of difficult Italian words that are hard to understand. He's going to type them into the chat so everybody can um, kind of understand what I'm saying. Um, many thanks to everybody who's made a donation for this class. We very much appreciate it. Um, I think, as y'all know, 100% of the production costs are covered by donations. So we really appreciate y'all's interest in being here and your, gener your generosity in participating and covering the production costs. Um, we are going to go today to Palermo, but first I'm going to just show you quickly where I live. So Palermo there on the map is that pink dot at the bottom, northwest coast of Sicily. And I live just south of Florence there, that other pink dot. So I live here. For those of y'all who don't know me, I'm Elaine Trigiani. I um, was an art historian in the United States and have been living in Italy for 20 years working in food and wine. Um, tourism and education, and um, I'm currently I'm, I'm shifting because of the pandemic. So um, I actually I collaborate with a small farm. We make olive oil, and I've been doing these virtual visits. So today we're going to do a virtual visit. Um, this is where I live at the um, Castle of Popiano on the estate of the Castle of Popiano, and I live down here just outside the castle walls. And that's my house with our little snowfall. Nothing like I know what y'all had. Y'all were underneath a lot of snow. So we are going to go. This is where I am here. We're going to go to Palermo. And I just want to go through quickly some of the places I'm going to mention, the dots that are in red. I'm going to mention that so I want y'all to have kind of an idea geographically where they are. Messina, which is the great port city here in um, Sicily. Naples, Urbino, which is there just south of San Marino. Venice, and then I'm going to mention, you know, the Netherlands are up here above France, obviously. Um, and quick um, kind of refresher course on history in the Mediterranean as well. We're going to go to Palermo, so to kind of have an understanding of Palermo. Um, Think about the Phoenicians who founded the city. They came from um, the area of Lebanon and Syria, and they started moving around the Mediterranean. I saw that. We have some Lebanese on the line. Woohoo! Um, they started moving around the Mediterranean, 1500, 1200 BC. They were mighty traders. They were um, setting up fortified ports, and they weren't colonizing they weren't making you know colonies with farmers and a government and all that they were just um, they had a port that was fortified dotted all throughout the mediterranean and importio or warehouses because they were moving goods and around that that was in about the 1200s they eventually founded the city of carthage which is now tunis which is right here and then they started settling more and they actually settled palermo so 800 bc they had founded palermo greece famously started settling the Mediterranean basin 150 years later. So Greece at about sort of 734 BC starts founding colonies here on the east coast of um, Sicily. They start practicing manifest destiny. They're going to take over the entire island. They find they're founding sub colonies and they're, you know, fighting just to gain more territory. And they push through and the, the Greeks get as far as Selinunte on the south coast as far as pretty much um, uh, Segesta here in the middle and on this top coast, on the north coast, they get as far as about Imera. And they don't get any further. They never take Palermo. So the Greeks never take Palermo. They made incursions, but they actually never took it over. Palermo was founded by the Phoenicians. They maintained an alliance with Carthage. Even during the Punic Wars, they were aligned with Carthage. So think about the Punic Wars, Car Carthage against Rome, 146 BC, finally Rome definitively wins and Sicily and the rest of the known world fall into the Roman Empire. So that's kind of what happens in the early days of Palermo. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and then kind of pro proceed on. So this is what Palermo looks like. It is an absolutely gorgeous city right on the Mediterranean. And you can see that's Monte Pellegrino in the middle. So the main um, corpo body of Palermo is what you see on the right. And then this sort of nice little seaside suburb called, called Mondello is what you see over here on the left over here. And I'm going to take, we're going to look at this area right here next. This is the port. So the reason that the Phoenicians wanted to be here, look at that great natural harbor. 
huge, great, protected natural harbor. That is why the Phoenicians came here in the first place. Um, it's been modified a little bit over the millennia, but that was the reason they were here. So today um, you can see the commercial port here is um, um, moorings for um, big ferry boats and cruise ships. And then this is called La Cala. This is the original port that the Phoenicians used. And now it's, um, you know, it's a nice little marina for pleasure craft. Um, and then take a look, there's this nice, um, kind of a boardwalk called Foro Italico along the city walls and there's a gate in the city walls right here. I'm going to show you that. So here's this gate in the city walls. It's called Porta Felice, which would be basically the happy door. And you can see a bit of wall right here and these great old palazzi that are just like perched up on top of the wall. So you're protected on the inside, but then you're on top of the wall and you have this view out over the Mediterranean Sea. It's gorgeous. So Porta Felice up close looks like this. Um, this was built in the in 1581 by one of the Spanish viceroys. All right, so there's lots going on in Sicily. The Spanish came in here in about 1300. They were here. This uh, they were they had viceroys in charge um, from uh, ruling from Palermo for about 500 years, one way or another. So that's a lot of uh, Spanish influence. They built this, and you can see this is sort of one of their emblems with these eagles up here. So they built Porta Felice, and Porta Felice is at the sea end of this road that's called the Castero. And the Castero is this ancient, ancient, ancient road. It was actually laid out by the Phoenicians in 800 BC. And it is a straight shot. And you can see it goes all the way kind of uphill to the site that the Phoenicians settled. It was the high point. It was good for def defensive purposes. This is where they had kind of their administrative buildings. And on that site right now, the other end of the Castero is what's called Porta Nuova, another one of these doors in the city walls. This was built again in the 1500s in honor of the um, Emperor Charles V. Um, and right next to it, you can see it's got this um, really cool base with this kind of rustic kitchens, these pilasters, and there are some Turks here. I think they had just won a war against some barbarians or something. I'm sorry, I don't remember them. I, I lost that little bit of detail. Look at the gorgeous cupola up here. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but it's this yellow and green Maiolica cupola. And here it is again, right here. And it's next to this point, this is the highest point in town, and that's, um, it was called the Caesar under the Arabs, so hence Casaro. This is the site where the Phoenicians first built their administrative center in the 8th century BC. The Arabs came in after that. We're going to talk a lot about them. Um, they had their um, kind of their Caesar or castle up here. And then the Normans came in. So the building that you see today was built by the Normans. 1100s, 12th century, and this was um, their um, royal residence. It's called the Palazzo dei Normanni. It's the seat of the Sicilian parliament today. So notice the Norman architecture. The base here is Phoenician, but notice the Norman architecture, these very interesting kind of turrets that are kind of um, muted at the top, and then these interlocking arches right here. You're going to see that some more of that. Um, those interlocking arches are, you see that a lot in Palermo, and it all goes back to these Norman buildings. Um, the private apartments of um, the kings are just encrusted with mosaics, and I'm just showing you a, one image of that so you have an idea of it. We'll talk about that in another, um, and sometime we'll get together on another Palermo episode, um, but I just, just to have an idea of those lovely mosaics. So here's Palermo from kind of from the air and how it developed. And the development of the city, um, I think it's really interesting as we go through all of these various invaders. And then the, you can still see the original footprint in um, the city today. So just looking at that map that's dated about 950 AD, you can see this is the original settlement by the Phoenicians. So the Arabs came in after the fall of the Roman Empire they came in, there was this, these Islamic Tunisians came in in the 830s AD, and they turned Sicily into an emirate. And it was a very big part of basically this um, Islamic empire. So Sicily is an emirate, and Palermo is the capital, and it was a huge cultural center. There was a population explosion here. Um, there was just cultural contamination from all over the world. And it was kind of like the glory days of Palermo. Um, the Arabs, uh, eventually, this bit of water course was filled in so that you can see the city as it appears today. And this zone right here is where we're going to go. We're going to focus on this zone. And it was named under Arab dominion Al Khaliza. 
Um, sometimes that's written with a K. And the area today is officially known as this area right here is Tribunale, Tribunal, but everybody calls it La Calza. They call it La Calza because it's La Javisa. That's what that, that's where that comes from. And that's not that's nothing official. It's just stuck in people's head. That's the historical memory is such that everybody just knows that this is La Hausa because it just is. So um, it's been that way since 800 AD. Why, why change it now? But the thing is, everybody remembers that. I love that about Palermo. There's this historic memory that's just like, you know, kind of beyond our, we can hardly understand that since our history is so brief. So 950 um, AD, the Arabs have come in they've settled this section as well. Move up, jump up to 1600, however many hundreds of years that is later. So now the Spanish are in charge. They've put up these walls and bastions. And in the year 1600, they decide to put in, so here's the Castro, remember? Here's the Castro again, Porto Felice and the Plaza de Normani. They decide to put in a crossroads. They're just trying to give some order to town. They put in this crossroad, this is called Via Maqueda. And this is called Quattro Canti. And they divide the city into four administrative areas called Mandamenti. And they're called Capo, Alberghiera, Castellamare, and Calza. And you can still see all of that in the current day plan of Palermo. You can see the, where the walls were. This is where the wall, the Spanish walls and bastions were right here. You can actually make out that little, fur, that little bit that the Phoenicians had first settled. The streets are all windy and curvy. Um, that's because the Arabs, um, uh, urban planning um, is more um, settled or uh, it's more kind of um, uh, organized around small courtyards. So winding streets and little small courtyards and winding streets and little small courtyards. Um, a Roman street plan, which y'all have seen in here with me recently, is more of a grid system, such as this part of town, which was built in the 1800s and 1900s, grid system, not down here. This is just a maze of little streets. So the Spanish gave it a little bit of order. And today we still have that crossroads here. Quattro Conti is here. So I'm gonna take y'all into the Calza neighborhood here. And we're gonna take a look at a museum and a couple of pieces in that museum. And then we're gonna go into a market um, over here in Mandamento Castellamare. And it's called the Bucheria, which y'all may have heard of. It's kind of a famous market. So here we are at Quattro Conti. This is that main crossroads of town. It's very, um, very dramatic. And then just two steps from here, going into Mandamento La Calza, we get this great church called San Cataldo. I'm just trying to give you all kind of a feeling of what this area of Palermo is like. This is a Norman building. It's very square and squat. It's got these sort of typical Norman um, kind of vaguely receding arches, sort of this uh, blind loggia. But when the Normans came in here in the 12th century, they took over um, a a country that are basically a, the island, the island of Sicily, that was had a um, mostly Islamic population. And they were very inclusive and they kept all of these Islamic craftsmen, hence this building that does, this is a Catholic church and it's probably unlike any Catholic church that y'all have seen. So notice these great tracery windows, this very lacy kind of Merletti cornice up here and that amazing little red dome. And there are three of those little red domes, not just one. Um, here's what that church looks like from the side. Um, so the interior was not actually finished. This was built in the 1130s. The person who commissioned it passed away before it was complete. So the interior would have had um, mosaics, but it did not get its mosaics. The mosaics you're looking at are from this church called La Martorana, same time period, Norman building. It's got a Baroque facade, but this is what the building looked like. This is the bell tower. It's lost its little um, red dome. And here too, just encrusted with these amazing, amazing mosaics. And we'll come back and look at these on another day. I just wanted to give you an idea of what's here. So when you're looking, if you're standing right about here and you're looking at these buildings, you're in Piazza Bellini. And if you just walk down some steps, you end up in these great little um, alleyways with these little courtyards. And so here you are in the Calza neighborhood. Um, this area had kind of been let, it's just had gotten kind of run down until the past sort of eight or you know, five or eight years. And now it's just exploding with, you know, cafes, art galleries, wine bars, it's, it's really fun, fun neighborhood. Tons of history there, but lots of sort of buildings that maybe haven't been kept up. They're renovating a lot now. I think they're, you know, putting in apartments and cute hotels and all that kind of stuff. Um, they're very good though with their dilapidated buildings. And I happen to find that kind of thing very charming. Um, so these are two buildings in Calza. Um, Santa Maria de los Pazimo on the left, this is almost like an emblem of the Calza neighborhood at this point. This was a basilica church that was put up um, in the early 1500s. And 
within a very short period of time, they started using it for um, theater performances that were open to the public. In the middle of the 1700s, the roof caved in and they just figured, well, we have nice weather, you know, it never rains. It's very, very, very temperate down here. We'll just leave the roof off. And this has been ongoing ever since as concert venue space for, um, they show movies outside, they do, you know, art installations. It's just great, really interesting venue. And then on the right, this is just kind of a happenstance. Um, this is an example of a use of one of these very old noble palaces that has been just in disuse and kind of crumbling, but charmingly so. And there was a uh, art, there was a contemporary installation here as part of the Manifesta um, Contemporary Art Fair in 2018, and it was in Palermo that year. It's nomadic. It was in Palermo in 2018. So you can see these people are, you know, walking down here. The stairwell, there's like a two by four hammered into the wall because the balustrade fell off. And so it's all this kind of crumbling. And they have this gorgeous red velvet curtain, you know, lovely hanging there. And it says tutto. And to me, that is Palermo. It's tutto. It's everything. Tutto means everything. And Palermo is just everything. And it's really hard to like get it into a slideshow, but I'm trying. So back to Calza, here is um, the Piazza della Calza. So there's tons of outdoor space. This is this little man called Aldo who cooks um, fish on a grill. The grill is about this big. It's a restaurant, but his grill is about as big as like, you know, a little toy, like a little Barbie thing. Sit outside, um, you know, kind of, like, there's just beautiful kind of waterside atmosphere. And then it's just full of these little nooks and crannies that just like kind of, you know, kind of drag you in. You can't help but go in there and just see what's going on. You know, all these cool little angles and stuff. So, um, just around the corner is Via Aloro, and Via Aloro um, is a, it's kind of a straight shot that ends in the sea. You can see the Mediterranean down there. I actually started coming here 20 years ago because I was working in an archive. So I was doing some research, and the building that you see here on the right is an archive at La Gancha. And then we're going to talk about this house right here. And this is a private residence. It's now a museum. It was built as a private residence for um, a man called Francesco Abatellis, and he was the Maestro Portolano del Reino. He was the, he was in charge of all the ports in the Kingdom of Spain. He was in the service of Ferdinand II of Aragon. That's the guy who sponsored Christopher Columbus. Remember Ferdinand and Isabella? So um, Mr. Abatellis, you know, maybe he knew Columbus. Um, and he had this lovely home. It was designed for him um, in the late 1400s by a Sicilian architect called Matteo Carni Livari. And it's this very particular style. It's basically um, Sicilian rena uh, Renaissance, but it combines some of that Norman stuff. It combines some of the Arab stuff. It's very, very particular. Um, com combines a lot of Catalan Gothic, which I'll show you in a minute. Some of this more Spanish style. So the Spaniards were here for literally 500 years. Tons, there was tons of um, cultural kind of cross-referencing going back and forth from, directly from Spain. So here's this building. It's a tight little alleyway. I, I'll show you the entrance in a second. Just want to point out though that it, it would have had it did have two towers. The second tower was destroyed in a bombing, a bombardment in April of 1943. So it's just got one tower today. So here's what the entry looks like and some of the windows. So you can see some of that tracery work. You can see those interlocking arches um, in the windows. You can see these lovely inlaid uh, lava, black lava stone and tarsia work. It's very common in Palermo, very dramatic kind of. You see that a lot in Sicily. And this is this Catalan Gothic arch, which is so, uh, again, kind of a dramatic way to frame that window or a door. But the thing about it is a very squat arch. It's not pointy. It's not tall and round. It's just kind of squat thing. So when you see that kind of arch, you know you're talking about Catalan Gothic with all those ribs and everything. Um, and we see a lot of that on the interior of this building as well. Um, and you see it all over Palermo. So when you come to Palermo, you'll know what you're looking for. Um, the doorway of this building is just amazing as well. It's this kind of series of interlocking ribs that kind of look almost kind of Art Nouveau. And um, they, I mean, it's an interesting way to kind of frame the door. It's not like you see in a church. In a church, they're usually taller and they're kind of trying to bring you in. This is more sort of solid. It's imposing. Um, sort of the idea of somebody important lives here. Don't, you know, don't be bugging us, right? Don't try anything. Um, on the inside, though, as soon as you walk in the door, you end up, everything lightens up considerably. You can see those Catalan Gothic arches here on these nice spindly um, columns. Um, the loggia, the upper floor is a little bit more attenuated. So you get into the courtyard and things lighten up uh, considerably. So the uh, home belonged to the Abitellis. They didn't have any heirs. Upon um, When they died, it got turned into a monastery. And then 
Eventually, the building was heavily damaged in World War II, but the artistic significance of the building was um, recognized by the regional government, and they decided to turn this into the Regional Art Gallery. And so they, they shored up the war damage, and they called in, this is 1950s, right after World War II, they called in the most influ influential architect of the 20th century, Carlos Scarfa, to come in here, oversee the renovation, and actually do the installation of the works of art. So he installed these works of art and made slight little modifications to the building just in order to have enough gallery space. But what he really tried to do was respect the building for what it is. And one of the, you know, one of the best works of art um, in this, museum is actually the installation itself and how this building was handled. So here's just an example, just two sort of interesting details put side by side. The original staircase by Carni Villari, which as you can see has um, the interlocking rib motif that we saw in that entry portal. And then Scarpa decided to put in a mezzanine, which I'll show you in a minute, and he needed a staircase to get up there. So, you know, he had the sensibility enough to not try and copy the original Catalan Gothic staircase nor did he put in anything that was too showy. He just put in this, kind of reminds me a little bit of those lava flow staircases that we've seen on some other buildings. He used local stone, these cantilevered risers, and look at the hexagonal plan of these risers. They're just really lovely, and they just kind of draw you upstairs. I mean, you can kind of, it's almost like, I don't know, it feels like it would be effortless to walk up those stairs somehow. And he's taking you up to this mezzanine level. So what he's done in order to kind of carve out gallery space is he's using the building to its best um, um, use. And he's basically just trying to use the building as is, like you can see here, taking advantage of natural light. There's a window that comes in right here on this bust. And when he needs to make sort of smaller areas like this for the um, Antonello da Messina space, he's using um, wooden panels that are mobile. So he's not really um, um, modifying the actual space of the building too much. The only thing they did do is put this mezzanine in. Here's the mezzanine. So this is the chapel that was added after the Abatellis family was no longer living here and had that huge tall ceiling with that ribbed um, vault down the middle. So in order to have a little bit more gallery space, they put in a mezzanine level. And it's really nicely done because it's not closed off and it's open. And when you come down here to the, to the end, you can actually see over the ledge and you're looking down on a painting that we're gonna look at in a minute. And it's this enormous 20 foot by 20 foot fresco. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really cool way to see it because you can actually see it from the ground level or you can see it from the mezzanine level. So you really get a good look at this, um, what is in a spectacular um, medieval painting. So first we're gonna look at three works of art. The first one is this bust uh, by Francesco Laurana. And it's called the bust of a uh, portrait of Eleonora di Aragona. Um, we kind of doubt that it was Eleanor of Aragon because she died a good 50 years before this thing was um, actually 65 years before this thing was uh, carved. Francesca Laurana was from uh, what is today Croatia. He um, was born, though, as a citizen of Venice. So it was uh, Croatia was Dalmatia at that point. So he was born as a, um, as a Venetian citizen. We don't know much about his kind of upbringing and his um, schooling, but he was this. Um, super successful Renaissance architect and sculpture and sculptor and medalist. He worked all throughout Italy, kind of helping to spread Renaissance ideals. He was in Venice, he was in Urbino, he was in Naples, and he was in Sicily. So Francesco Laurana, he's done all, he's, he has, his body of works is quite varied, but he has actually got a series of busts like this. And so this is a very kind of, enigmatic portrait. Um, it's quite beautiful, but it's also sort of mysterious. Um, you know, the first thing I notice is the texture contrast between sort of her gauzy head wrap and then that beautiful, well, just nicely polished, very kind of voluminous um, skin. And if you look at how he has um, modeled her face, he's relying on geometric forms, planes, ovoids, isosceles, triangles, if you look at it with today's eyes, it's almost like it's going towards abstraction. You kind of can't get a handle on it. Um, an artist told me that he was a sculptor actually was trying to draw this. He couldn't draw it. It's just you can't you can't get you can't get a handle on it. So I'm, you're just you've been staring at one viewpoint, but look what happens when you just look. If you just move an inch, look how different she looks. Every time you move, she completely changes. So if somebody's sitting there trying to draw this thing, you can't do it. It's almost like she's kind of you know shape shifting or something. 
So here's how she's installed there on the right um, in the current uh, installation by Scarfa. There's also this very strong sense of canonical proportion, proportion of head to body, proportion of um, character facial characteristics on the head itself, very kind of formal composition, very pure composition. She's got that downward glance, that kind of a hint of a smile. She's about to start to smile. It's very detached elegance. All of those things make us think that perhaps he knew Piero della Francesca. Do y'all remember Piero della Francesca? I'm going to show you so you will remember. Um, we don't have any documents that prove that they were together, but they were both um, in Urbino at some point. And so we think maybe the royal court at Urbino, the, um, the ducal palace, the ducal court of Federico da Montefeltro might be a linking point. We also believe that Laurana knew Antonello di Messina, dot Messina, excuse me. Um, this is a Sicilian born artist. He is a Renaissance painter. He was born in Messina. Um, Messina is that great port town. It was a, um, you know, just full of just, you know, coming and going and all sorts of cross-cultural um, contamination. Um, Northern artists were coming in here, we know that. Um, and people were also, he was, you could travel very easily because he was at this port. So he actually spent a lot of his time in Venice and he just went from Messina up to Venice. So we know that he was there. Um, we also know that he was in Naples and we believe he might pass through Urbino as well. So if you look at this, this is um, the Virgin Annunciate painted in 1475. And he's got sort of similar canonical proportions, geometric structure, look at all the triangles, triangles all over the place. Um, lovely sort of ovals and then the little heart shape that matches her face in there and that same kind of aloof detachment and that little hint of a smile and again we're thinking he must have known Piero della Francesca so we hear that those Piero della Francesca works that we've seen a couple months ago um, Mary um, the Madonna is seen in um, the Church of San Francesco in Arezzo the Madonna del Parto in Monterchi and then the Maria Magdalene who's in um, the Duomo of Arezzo. So you can kind of see that these guys were definitely kind of playing off each other and they were all moving around between these royal courts. And um, that's how these, that's how the Renaissance style was spreading. These guys had contact and um, they were all learning from one another. So Antonello also is painting in oils, which kind of gives him an edge as far as um, kind of forming, modeling figures and um, using chiaroscuro to actually kind of make that very kind of soft modeling. The difference with fresco, which is what Piero was working in, you know, this is a very opaque um, way of laying down color. The pigment is actually laid into wet plaster. It's totally opaque. Oil painting is different. Oil painting, you literally have a ground of some color of your choice, you know, white or other color, and you lay on layers and layers and layers of transparent color. So the white pierces through all those layers of paint hits the ground and then comes back out. So you can really play with that and get all of this luminosity. And Antonello was so good at this that for a very long time, we thought he was the guy, we thought he went to the Netherlands, learned how to do this from those Netherlandish painters. And we thought he was the guy who brought the oil painting technique back into Italy. Turns out that's not true, but that's how good he was that one of his biographers actually credited him with that. Um, The way he has constructed this painting, um, just kind of the more you look at it, the more it kind of just draws you in. So he um, has used perspective to kind of, this is a very small devotional painting. You, you're up close and personal with the Madonna here. He's used perspective to kind of break through the picture plane. So he's breaking down the barrier between you and the Madonna. The Madonna has just found out, Gabriel has just told her that she is pregnant with the son of God. So it's that moment where she was reading and now she's gone like this, like she's a little bit surprised, although she's kind of taking it well, you know, she's got this very kind of um, calm countenance. So her hand is up, her hand is kind of piercing through the plane, the picture plane. And if you look here, her desk kind of is set obliquely. So the corner kind of punches out as well. So it's kind of linking our space with her space. So it's making it more a more personal experience in a way. And also think about what's going on here. 
she has just been told by the angel Gabriel that she's pregnant with the son of God. It's kind of a big deal. Um, so where is Gabriel? Usually, you know, you have Gabriel flying in. Gabriel flies in and the Madonna's over here. Well, but you're, you're seeing the Madonna front on. So where is Gabriel? Gabriel is like right behind my left shoulder. So when you're in here, this is this devotional image that is just drawing you in and you're not just in the space of the Madonna. I'm like, you're actually in this, this whole scene is happening right here. I mean, it's a really super effective way of kind of, you know, the idea is to sort of bring you into meditation and prayer. And I've just, there's, there are no other paintings like this. I don't think anybody has, that's just, I mean, in a way they call it a device, right? It's an illusionistic device that kind of helps you feel like you're in this space, but um, just, it's a pretty shocking composition and absolutely gorgeous. The, you, you have to go to Palermo and see in person. So we're gonna jump over now to that huge 20 by 20 foot fresco that we just saw there at the end of the mezzanine level. Um, this is 1445 international Gothic style from a hospital building in Palermo. It's a royal commission. So um, the um, Spanish king commissioned this from some artist. We're not sure who it is. Um, he looks sort of French, actually, if you sort of look at the headdresses over here. It's not, it's not Italian for sure. Um, what we're looking at, though, is the triumph of death. Il Triunfo della Morte. And um, it's a really interesting image. There's a lot going on, but it's a nice successful composition. So we're inside of a kind of a garden of earthly delights, right? People are, um, there's a fountain of youth, and there's all of these, you know, there's a beautiful hedge and all of these beautiful plants. But unfortunately, death is kind of galloping through, sowing discord as he does. And you can see death here is a skeleton with his scythe. He's riding this just horrible skeletal horse. And he also has a quiver, and he's been shooting with his bow arrows and sort of, you know, deciding who he's going to kill. So the idea is this is a memento mori. Um, so, you know, kind of to help us focus in on the fact that life is short. It's also um, kind of a comment on society in that the horse is halfway through this, the garden of earthly delights, um, and he skipped this group. He's left them alive. And these are the um, kind of the more humble classes. The ruling class is piled up here on the bottom. These are emperors and popes. And then these sort of, you know, frivolous noblemen are over here um, singing and playing music and having a chit chat around the fountain of youth. And they're going to go hunting with their falcons and their fancy dogs. Um, they don't know what's coming, but one of their party has already gotten it with an arrow to the neck. Very dramatic. Here's some just some close up details of that. So let's like go back and skip the death part and go back to the garden of earthly delights part. Um, and we're gonna go back outside. We're gonna cross over the Casero and go into um, the um, mandamento called Castellamare and into the market called the Bucheria. And this to me is the garden of earthly delights. There is just, there's just so much going on in Palermo. Like I said before, Palermo is tutto. It's just everything. And it's just, Palermo is just, I mean, the history is just, there's just so much of it. It's just a lot. It kind of kind of gets you in the gut, you know? So here we are in this market. So when the Arabs came in, and remember I said there was a population explosion, they were also, they were concerned about food distribution. So they set up souks. There were souks in all these different areas of the city. And these markets are the descendants of these souks. And you can just get absolutely everything and of course it's all super fresh and flavorful and in season and you know fresh fished and of course you have these kind of guys who've got all of their you know parts out on the sidewalk these are some of my favorite um things to buy in these markets um if the season is right those just i mean what is more romantic than a milky green raw almond no just heavenly and then the tomato paste which you can't ever the tomato paste in the market in palermo it's just i mean look at that it's like this hunk of modeling clay and they just have this paddle that they scoop it out of there with the tomatoes are so flavorful it almost tastes like it has cinnamon in it. it's just so it's kind of spicy and then of course you can get anything else underwear or objet you know objet d'art anything you need this is really a very cool market um another thing that kind of is part of this souk as founded by 
the Arabs is the idea of street food in the market. So um, we're going to make one of these. We're going to make a spinchone. Um, but here you can see some of, there's kind of a lot of famous street foods in Palermo. And there's are a couple of them. And you're looking at panelle, which are these kind of chickpea flour fritters. We've talked about chickpea flour before um, when we were in Livorno. This is sort of, you know, the, the Sicilian falafel, basically. And it's a color called panelle and their sardine sandwich called our panino con le panelle. And then, of course, arancine, which are these big rice balls. We'll make those next time we talk about Palermo. And all of these things get fried. And I love it. There's like the Madonna of the fryer over there on the left. It's kind of very Palermitano as well. You've got to have the Madonna protecting your fry pot. They also, these guys eat a lot of offal. Um, I don't go for all of this. I'll eat a spleen sandwich. That's actually kind of good. The one on the right is um, spleen. It's called pane ka mayusa. So spleen sandwich. Um, it's tasty. He's putting some little, um, some good cheese on there for you, which, which makes it maritatoed. So when the spleen has cheese on it, it's married spleen. In the middle are uh, various types of chitlins. Um, but my favorite's the one in the center where that guy just reaches his fist into that, <laughs> like the mystery meat blanket covered basket, you know, and just kind of reaches it out. Um, I was, I did a trip with a group of chefs. We did a, a tour all through Southern Italy and they loved the mystery meat chitlin basket. That was their favorite. And then on the left is um, the cow face salad. We'll be skipping that tonight too, just so you know, but it's available in case you're interested. So tonight we're gonna make spintone, which is kind of like a really tasty focaccia. And the word spintone actually comes from um, the Arabic. So Spinche, spinche with a C are made all over Sicily. Usually for like, you know, for St. St. Joseph's Day, they'll make spinche where just like little fried dough balls they dip in sugar. But the idea is that they're very kind of spongy. So the word spinche apparently in Arabic means spongy. We're gonna make a big one, a spinchone. So that O-N-E makes it, makes it the big one. And we're gonna make a big, huge spongy focaccia. And we're gonna make this hilarious um, sweet and sour squash, which is called Ufica tu Risette Canola, which literally means liver from the fountain of the seven spigots. And here's the fountain of the seven spigots. So the story is that the folks who live here are kind of working class and they can't, they actually can't afford the sweet and sour liver dish they would like to eat. And so they all just started making it with squash. There was, I think there was a restaurant here who actually started doing that. I'm really not sure when that happened because the sweet and sour influence, the sweet and sour idea was actually from the Arab times. But squash, of course, was brought back in um, after Columbus discovered the Americas. So um, it's definitely a later recipe. So but the the liver from Sete Canola is actually sweet and sour squash. So we're going to make those two recipes. Let me see if I can get out of the share screen thing. OK, here we go. Elaine, sorry, uh, uh -huh. we, uh, we have an, a question. OK, uh, Franz asked uh, about uh, the mezzanine the picture in the mezzanine, the paintings in the mezzanine. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, and uh, she asked uh, um, if the painting are open to the elements, or is... No, those are actually, no, that there's a roof on that building. Yes, there's a roof. It's just that the mezzanine doesn't go all the way to the end. So um, you can sort of, you, walk, you can kind of get a view down to the ground floor. It's like a loft kind of, they kind of built a loft up there, that's what they did. And uh, I take one minute uh, because uh, Nicole asked why Palermo was attacked in in the in the World, world War Two, and I say that uh, 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 Palermo was attacked by all <laughs> because first by the Allies to to free, and then by the German to re take back Palermo. So it's a right. very... It, it got pummeled. Sicily was pummeled on all sides. The, you know, the Allied forces came in through Sicily to try and go up to the Italian peninsula and liberate Italy. So yeah, it was pummeled. And there's a huge port there. It was just, you know, tons of war damage. You still see it walking around. Um, all right, I'm going to make the dough, the bread dough for the spinchone, and it's actually a risen dough. Um, and it's super simple though. You, it's one of the, you mix it, you put it in the pan, and you never touch it again until you eat it. You just stick it, you let it rise and you stick it in the oven without having to rework it again. So I've used plain old all purpose flour and I'm using some um, semolina flour. This is super, super fine semola. And if you get it, you need to use some of this, but if you get it at home, it's probably gonna be coarse. You might wanna whip it through a um, uh, Cuisinart just to make it finer because it needs to be kind of super fine like sand. So those are, the two flowers we're going to use. And then these, this is 
like I said, part of the Palermitano street food um, scene. And there's a good bit of sugar in here, some salt and some sugar. And it's a little bit more sugar than you normally put in a yeast dough, but that's kind of how they do it. And that's part of it. Um, it's very nice. It makes this very soft, squishy dough that has a light sweetness to it. Um, so I have the kind of yeast that I get is um, cake yeast. Um, I'll send you the recipe so you can kind of translate it back. I don't think, can y'all get cake yeast? I think y'all use um, those little packets of the dried powder. So for me to do this, I put the sugar in here. I'm just going to mix this up with some warm water. Let me get that. So y'all would proof your yeast like you're used to doing. And I'm just going to stir them, kind of break this up and just stir it around in here so that until it kind of melts. So the water is warm, so it kind of helps activate the yeast. So I love this yeast, it's great, but it, it you know, it's, it expires in like three days. Kind of hard to keep around. Elaine, cake yeast is available in the US um, in some grocery stores or historically it has been. Uh -huh. uh, and dissolving it does not take the exact um, temperature that the uh, granulated yeast takes. I know that it, always used to freak me out, having to get it to the right temperature. Yeah. So I'm just going to slowly stir this in here. It makes a real soft dough. So this is this when you the topping here. So the bottom is this kind of sweet, spongy sfinche, right? Sfinchone, big sfinche. And then the topping is just this amazing kind of layers and layers of flavor. And again, I don't know how to. You know, Palermo is just a palimpsest. Just it is. It is layers of history, layers of time, layers of flavor. So in a recipe like this. Um, it's called a sfinchone, so it's got Arabic background uh, origins of some sort, but it's also got tomatoes in it. So the tomatoes come from the New World. So clearly, um, they weren't making sfinchone in this way until at least you know sort of mid 1500s, if not later than that. And I would be guess I would guess a little bit later even. So so see how that dough just comes together. It's kind of forgiving. I'm not, I'm not. I'm just kind of mixing it. I'm not even really kneading it. I'm just mixing it up nicely. So I'm going to spread this in um, the bottom of the pan that it gets cooked in. Um, there's a little. I just learned a trick, um, and the trick is to line the pan not just with oil, but with. I'm using Sicilian olive oil, by the way. Um, so the trick here is to make sure that it's oiled so that it won't stick. And then I'm going to throw some breadcrumbs down the bottom. There's a hefty dose of breadcrumbs in the topping part, which is just, again, just this amazing kind of layer, layers and layers and layers of flavors. So here is just some breadcrumbs on the bottom. Now I'm just going to spread this out. until it covers. You can use, this isn't very sticky, but if it's sticky, you can just put some oil on here so that you can um, move it around. Okay. There. All right, I'm gonna rinse my hands real quick, excuse me. All right, wait till you see what goes into this topping. It's kind of funny. The idea of the um, this is mix of super, super strong flavors. So there's the dough. So now we're going to mix in all of the flavors for the topping. And there is 
Um, this is Sicilian, grated Sicilian Pecorino cheese. And you can use Pecorino Romano if you can't get this. And I actually decided kind of last minute that I wanted this cheese and I called my cousin in Sicily and I begged him to send me some. And he like got in the car and ran over to like four towns over and sent me this enormous hunk of um, super strong Sicilian, super aged Pecorino cheese. And I'll have enough for like the next you know year and a half, which is great. Um, you, you come in Florence, no? <laughs> yeah, Lorenzo wants some of that cheese. So, all right, so cheese, you can use strong sheep's milk cheese is the idea here. And then that gets mixed up with breadcrumbs. And these are um, kind of toasty breadcrumbs. Nothing, no spices or anything, just breadcrumbs. Um, I'll send y'all the recipe, the amounts tomorrow. And then just tomato passata, that really um, just simple cooked down tomatoes. There's nothing in here but tomatoes. I may add a little bit more of that just to make sure it's spreadable. So remember, we have tomatoes, we have super strong cheese, now we have anchovies. And um, I'm just going to, I think I've shown you all this before, but anchovies are, if you get fresh anchovies, it's just like a little fresh fish. You can see it has little scales on it. You see what color it is? And it's kind of firm. If you squish it, it's actually kind of firm. It's not dark. It's very light colored. And it just kind of smells like the ocean and it is not um it's just not um super it's not too strong it's a strong flavor but it's not that um if you get bad quality anchovies or old anchovies for that matter i'm cleaning this there's a little bit of scales and uh i think a little bit of a tail on here um if you get old anchovies they're squishy this is, has a lot of body to it the older anchovies expire basically and they get kind of grainy and dark brown and they don't taste good so you want a nice fresh anchovy that tastes like the ocean and i'm just going to break it up into pieces and then kind of the main body of this is um caramelized onions so i've just used um, red onions and i have already browned them for y'all just to save us a little bit of time. So this is kind of three onions. Can y'all get a kind of see what color these are? I kind of, they're not totally caramelized, but they're on the way to being caramelized. And I did it with a good bit of olive oil. So um, that's gonna kind of add some liquid to this. It's better to add the cold. The onions or? Yeah, I don't onions. think it matters. No, you can or you can add them hot. It doesn't matter. I have added them hot. It works fine. I think this is enough onions. So now I'm just stirring all this together. Super, super flavorful. It's gonna kind of almost be like a kind of a thick mixture, kind of almost like a paste in a way. And if it's not um, if it looks too dry, I'm going to add another little drop of tomato sauce, which I may be doing right now. Good. And then the last thing is um, oregano, which we're going to put directly on top. So this gets spread on top of the dough. It rises for two hours in a warm place. I'm going to go put it over there by the fireplace. And then you just slide it directly in the oven. No punching down, no reforming the dough, none of that. You just literally put everything on top of the dough. And it rises all together. And it'll kind of, um, it pretty much doubles. The dough pretty much doubles. I probably could have used a bigger pan, but I didn't. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm kind of just flattening this out, but I'm not putting any pressure on here. I don't want to squish the dough down at all. All right, so there's the topping. And then last step is oregano. And this is just another one of those lovely things. I get this when I go down to the south. They just pick it off the mountain and you just get it. It's like a bouquet. And you want to put a good amount of oregano on here.
and then drizzle with olive oil. And then I'm just going to put um, a piece of tin foil on top and a cloth, and off it goes. This is kind of, I mean, it's kind of a, as far as the flavors go, it's a pretty spectacular recipe because the, the flavors are just absolutely very, very, like I said, very kind of complex layers, a very strong flavor. So this is what it looks like. Um, again, just put it in a warm place, two hours, then it goes into an oven for um, 30 minutes and you're done. And it's excellent. So I'm going to wrap it up like this. Actually, I think I'm going to use a bigger one. And I'm going to put it by the fireplace because that's the only place in my house that's warm. I um, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, uh, what if you can't get fresh anchovies? Well, these are um, these are um, these are these are packed under oil. They're just before their expiry date, so they're not fresh fish. Those are actually the anchovies packed under oil, but they're good quality and they're not expired. So I see a lot of times I've seen in the United States those mushy dark brown things. Something is wrong with them. So look for just good quality canned or jarred anchovies. So it's, it's, they're anchovies that are preserved under oil. They just are a good quality. Um, and again, not out of date. I think maybe that's the problem. I have, have had that happen to me that, you know, they just are um, past their best buy date and they're really not very good. So now we're going to make this squash. It's this kind of funny little squash dish, the usika too. Um, and the squash you can cook in the oven. I just used a butternut squash. And um, actually I got this giant, again, everything's giant. And I got this giant piece of squash from my um, vegetable guys. I think y'all saw the picture in there. It was like, it you know, took two of them to hold the thing up. So I just got a big chunk of squash cut it into pieces about half an inch thick, and you can put it in the oven. You can just put it on a sheet pan and put it in the oven at, at 350 for, you know, sort of 15, 20 minutes until it cooks, maybe with some salt and olive oil on it. Um, salt. Um, I went ahead and fried it in the pan because that's kind of what the recipe wants you to do. Um, either way is fine. So I've already fried the squash. You can see it's kind of, it kind of gets a prettier color if you do it in the, in the fry pan. Um, so fry the squash in olive oil. I'm going to put a little bit of salt on it, and I'm going to make this um, really interesting sweet and sour sauce, which is so sort of peculiar to Italy, uh, to Sicily. And again, as I said, that sort of comes from this Arabic tradition. So this takes, um, let's see, mint goes on top of the squash. And then we're just going to warm up um, a squished garlic clove. I need to slam this, but this thing isn't oops, too unstable. So smashed garlic clove, let me try it here, there. Smashed garlic clove, olive oil. I'm gonna add a little piece of hot pepper. My hot peppers are so hot, I'm not adding very much. I'm gonna just cut that in two pieces and um, take it out. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna chop it up fine because that just gives, it gives off enough heat just like that. So this gets warmed up and then you can add vinegar and sugar. I'm going to add vinegar and honey. I just prefer to avoid the sugar. So as soon as the garlic and hot pepper have released um, some flavor into the oil, we'll add the, the other flavors. So again, just interesting layers of flavor in the honey with the vinegar and then the mint on the squash. It's, real, it's a really good side dish. And this is made, um, this is kind of one of those things that's actually um, sort of better the next day. Usually we eat at room temperature and it's usually really good with a piece of bread and the sauce is yummy. So this is starting to kind of do its thing. 
singing, as the old ladies like to say. You can use other types of squash. Um, I use kind of butternut squash. You can use anything that will keep it, um, anything that will keep its um, shape. You don't want to use a squash like that Delicia squash. Last time we cooked squash, is a squash. Mantovana one? No, don't use Mantovana. Okay. Mantovana turns into a puree. You don't want that. You want it to hold its shape. So I'm putting in about a tablespoon of honey. And I'm going to kind of just melt that and boil it with a quarter cup of vinegar. So I'm going to let this bubble just for a minute so that kind of some of that acrid odor of the vinegar um, boils off. And then I'm going to pour it over the squash and we're good to go. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Elaine, is it served as an appetizer, as a side, or just food? <laughs> uh, um, it can be an appetizer or a side. Somebody asked me once, that made me think, that somebody asked me once, so that, so an Italian didn't understand what, how, you, how do you eat peanut butter? Like, is it, is it a side dish or an antipasto or how do you eat peanut butter? I'm like, well, it just, it's just the food. Like, that's just what you eat, you know? That was the kind of, they, they still didn't get it. Anyway, I thought that was funny. So, you, put, you put it on white bread and have a sip of gin with it. You can do that. Oh, peanut butter. <laughs> or you can do that with this too. This is, the sauce is really good on um, on bread or toast. You can actually make little crostini. You want to you serve it you know, on an appetizer platter with other things. Or um, I'm going to actually make a steak later and have it as a side dish with, with the steak. So this is kind of, almost kind of getting thick. I'm going to just pour this on here and excuse me because I'm going to have to do it this way. You can't see. I'm just going to pour this on and then it just sort of just flavors that squash. That's kind of more sauce than I need. And then, like I said, this will be even better tomorrow. So there's that. And now I, of course, have just for y'all a... Um, Spinchone in the oven already done. So your spinchone after um, two hours of rising, you put it in the oven for um, 30 minutes, and then here we go. And it comes out. And I'm going to cut a little piece. Let's see what it looks like. I'm going to get a some kind of a serrated knife though. I think. Smell, it's just got this amazing, amazing perfume. So you can get this, kind of, this bakery sell this, you can get, you know, slabs of this, you can just get a little nibble of this, you can buy it in the market. This is, uh, like I said, very kind of typical Palermitano treat. So I can get it out of here. And here it is. Look how yummy that looks. Yum, squishy, squishy bread, kind of sweet with all of those flavors on top. It is so good. It's been shown it. You'll have to try it. Do it like that. So there we go. Any questions? Do you deliver? <laughs> I wish y'all could just come over for dinner. It'd be so fun. <laughs> Elaine, what, what, was the uh -huh. name, what was the name of the little church at the very first of your presentation? San Cataldo. I can type uh, that in. I write in the chat if you want. San Cataldo. San Cataldo. I have a sketch here that I did of a floor plan of, I think it's uh, Martorana, you know, Chiesa Martorana? It's, Martorana is uh, the one next door. Uh -huh. yeah, can, can you see this? I did. Oh, hang on. I cannot, but I'll, let me look. I did that when uh, when we were there. I don't know how many years ago, but uh, I was enamored of the floor plan of. Uh, hey, Joe Gentino, hang on a second. I'm trying to find it. I can't see. I don't. I can't. I'm sorry. Can't find so, me. Yeah, it hasn't. No, I can't. I that does. Yeah, that does have an interesting floor plan, and um, interesting construction too. There's just kind of a dome with those pendentives, and it's all very. Yeah, that was the dome. Kind of it's, it's, exotic. It's, it's, yeah. 
We have two, two mm -hmm. questions for uh, Sfincione. The first is if you can use lemon juice in place of vinegar. For that would, oh, um, <clears throat> I don't think it would have the same effect because um, it needs to be sweet and sour. I'm trying to think how the honey and lemon would be. That makes me think of tea. Um, I don't know. You could try it. You can try. Yeah. And also what kind of vinegar? Oh, I just used a white wine vinegar. Um, nothing fancy. Um, but you know, kind of not, not, not something you clean your house with, you know, something a little bit more mild. So. The, the other question is, uh, I think it's the, uh, very difficult to, to, to say, but if you, if you, you, can you play with the choice of toppings of the, for the no. bread? I think, <laughs> eh, okay. <laughs> if you want to make the original finchone, <laughs> you cannot. No, this is finchone. You can, um, you can actually, some of the spinchones are a little bit more scratch with just um, cheese, um, mostly cheese, tomato, oregano with maybe just a hint of onion and maybe you know one anchovy laid on top. I kind of make it a little bit richer. So sorry, we're being rigid. You have to make the palermitano spinchone. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked, can you use wine instead of vinegar? I think you really need that tang from the vinegar. I just, I think you might just go ahead and use the vinegar. Um, the wine would not give you the same tang. So, Yeah, you can take out the anchovies. I'll, I'm, I'm reading the chat. Somebody says, um, not crazy about anchovies. Yes, you can take out the anchovies. But uh, again, if you find some good anchovies and you just use a little drop here and there, um, it just really gives richness without being super obvious that you're eating an anchovy. Um, but if you just can't stand them, then leave them out. That's fine. But don't tell anybody in Palermo. What, what about the anchovy sauce? Um, what's the name? Of, uh, starts with a C. Oh, colatura di alice. Colatura. Um, that's a, yeah, that's different. You don't, you would not use that here. This is like Asian fish sauce, but it's Italian, uh, ancient Roman fish sauce. <clears throat> um, yeah, you would not use that here. You would actually you need pieces of fish for this one. Elaine, what is the name of the special cheese you put in there? I realize it's a pecorino, but what is it? What's pecorino the name? Pecorino Siciliano. It's Sicilian aged pecorino. Oh. It doesn't have a name. Okay. It's just it's just that. It's just aged Sicilian pecorino, and it's it's to great. So the idea is that it's been aged for more than six months. Um, it does have a particular flavor, but basically you just need a strong sheet milk cheese, which is why um, I think Pecorino uh, Romano would do a good job as well. So, um, Hang on a second. I'm looking at the chat. Okay, Cindy, I'll get you that. Um, okay, good. All right, we're talking about recipes. Oh, I'm going to send the recipes to everybody who registered. If you did not register go, and you want the recipes, just let me know. And y'all, check your spam folder. I'm having lots of trouble with stuff going to spam. So if you don't see the recipes by sort of Monday evening, check your spam folder. And then if you still don't get them, just send me a message. I think there's some sort of spam filter further up the upstream and things are getting filtered out. So um, I promise I'm sending them to you, but you may not be getting them, but I can forward them to you individually and that skips the spam folder. Um, so is there any more questions? All right, thank y'all for tuning in. It's great to see everybody here. I hope y'all enjoyed it and I hope y'all will make these recipes. Thank they you. are super we'll flavorful. That. Thank you. Super flavorful. Thank and then everybody come, come to Palermo as soon as you can. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, yes. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye y'all. So good to see y'all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 Hello.